Let's go to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8 this morning. And we'll go ahead and pray and ask the Lord for help for the Sunday school lesson this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and we thank you for this chance for us to come together here at the Baptist Church to learn more about you and your Lord. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Spirit of God to be able to illuminate us with regards to the security of our salvation. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially that salvation which was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And this morning we'll continue our studies here in the book of Romans. And we've arrived at the end of Romans chapter 8. Praise the Lord. Okay. And we see a lot in this chapter, all this stuff about walking in the Spirit and uh, that the sufferings of this present time can't be compared to the things that are coming later, that glory that shall be revealed in us. We learned about the adoption. So with the redemption of our body, the fact that all the Godhead is working with us, we continue to grow in God's purpose. And that leads us to Romans 8, verse 31. Romans 8, verse 31, and here we're going to see the conclusion to Paul's argument here in Romans 8, and he's going to do it uh, through five key questions here, okay, five questions, starting with the first, it shows us a conclusion, Romans 8, verse 31, what shall we say then, or what shall we then say, excuse me, Lord, to these things, talking about everything we just spoke about in the chapter, all this great stuff we learned, all the promises of God, the reality that we're living forever. What shall we then say? Right. Second question. If God be for us, who can be against us? And here we see Paul answering his first question with the rhetorical second one, showing he has a little bit of sarcasm in him. Yeah. Same thing is true with God when you read the uh, prophetic books. You find out that God can be sarcastic. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that, Christian, if you want to be as well. Okay. Just keep it holy, I guess. And I like that. The idea is, well, that's the first thing. If God be for you, who could be against you? Remember, we saw in Romans 8, verses 26 through 28, that the Spirit of God is uttering groanings which cannot be uttered in you to help you grow. And that Jesus Christ is interceding on, be on your behalf as a high priest to the Father. And they, too, are working together to fulfill God the Father's will in your life, to fulfill that purpose because you love him. Okay? You got saved, right? That means you're in the love of God. Sam. So if God be for you, and that's the entire God, who can be against you? <coughs> okay, that's a good question. Nobody's beaten God yet. I mean, I sure haven't. And the strongest creature in the universe, he got, he got a great handicap. He got 40 days and 40 nights of the, the Lord of glory starving himself, and he had no chance whatsoever. Okay? So if God be for you, who can be against you? No one. See that? And that's the first thing he wants, he wants you to recognize. Uh, this is going to happen. All these things are going to succeed. And I have verses there. John 14 talks about the Spirit of God, the Comforter, coming to help you. And Matthew 28 tells you that Jesus Christ said, Lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. He'll be with you through the thick and thin. Uh, always and always actually have different meanings. Uh, always like all the way through. So he's trying to give you more of an intimate connection there. Not just always, oh yeah, my presence is here. No, I'm walking with you. I'm in the yoke with you. And then Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, has that famous verse where it talks about God never leaving thee nor forsaking thee. And you can apply to God the Father if you like. Okay. Who can be against you? Now, we talked about all the creatures in the universe. Okay. But there's one creature that many Christians think actually has a chance. Okay? You know which creature that is? Ourselves. And this rhetorical question actually applies as far as you. You can't even stop this. Okay? Go to Job 10. Job chapter 10. Let me show you somebody who's dealt with more problems and suffering than any other person on earth apart from the Lord himself. Okay? We don't come close to Job. Job 10. 
This is part of the stress here in this conclusion here. God's got a purpose, okay, and it's greater than even your own flesh because you're walking according to the Spirit. He's having victory in your life. But Job 10 and verse 1, let me show you somebody who went through suffering because he lost all his children, he lost all his wealth, and he lost his health. All within the span of two days. Okay? This man had 10 kids, wiped out. I don't even want to know what it feels like to lose one. And so he says in Job 10 verse 1, and I, I do, right? Okay, well, I'm discouraged, I do understand what it's like to lose one. That was horrible. But Job 10 verse 1, My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. So he's telling you, look, I'm letting you know how I feel. Verse 18, Wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Oh, that I had given up the ghost, and no eye had seen me, preferred to have died in the womb. After all this, that had happened. It's quite understandable. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Okay? He wanted to die after. And through this entire trial, God was with him. And God got him through and God gave him double everything he had prior when, when the whole thing was said and done. Okay. So even Job, when he wasn't born again, okay, he didn't have the Spirit of God living in his heart like he does permanently like we do. Even in that situation, God was with him every step of the way. What about you? If God's living in you. Okay. And we're going to see this as we continue. Okay. Many people have questions about suicide. Okay, for Christians, do they go to heaven? Okay, well, if God be for you, who can be against you? That includes you. Okay? And so we'll look at this. Something to think about. And I think if God was able to help Job, I can trust him to help me in my worst moment. Is that you? Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 32. So that's two questions down here. Three more to go. Okay. Verse 32. He that spared not his own son, this is God the Father. Okay, think about this. He delivered his son. Okay. He gave his only begotten son, right? He that not spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Another rhetorical question. Okay. Now, the reason why this is rhetorical is because God already gave you his best. He gave you his all. He gave you himself. Okay? Son of God is God manifesting the flesh, is what that means. He gave his being and his life to you. So what's everything else in the universe? It's nothing. You're heirs of God that we read. See that? So if you have that in your perspective, in your Christian walk, it's going to help you continue when you have moments of trial because they're going to come. Now, I like this because it's about being an heir of God. Go to John 14. John 14. Let me show you something. Here. All these questions here are tied directly to the Son of God because you're in Him, so you now have all His blessings. So all the things He talked about here in John 14 can be applied to you today. John 14, verse 13, the Lord reminds us, and he says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. Notice, not just ask, it's in his name. There's something specific here. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And okay, remind you, what is the glorification? That God the Father delivered his Son to save you. The Son desired to do that to glorify his Father's plan which was to provide salvation to all of us. Okay. 14, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. God desires, Jesus Christ desires to do anything that's in his name for you. And then he qualifies it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay. So one of the reasons why you're always going to have the victory, Christians, because you're in this book here, you're looking at the commandments and you say, oh, God desires this for my life because he wants me to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, verse 29. See that? So all those things that are guaranteed to you are the things that he gave his son, and his son always did his father's will. That's the key. Okay. 
All things does not mean I'm going to get, you know, a Bugatti tomorrow if I pray for it. It's not what that means, okay? And to be honest, you already promised something better than a Bugatti. It's the new body. It's faster than the speed of light, ladies and gentlemen, okay? He ascended. You know how far that was, okay? He did it like this, like nothing. Bugatti's got nothing on that. Sometimes we, we just we lose sight of things, okay? So Paul, continuing with the sarcasm, look, he didn't spare his son, okay? What wouldn't he give you? But you need to look and see what he gave his son so you can see what you can ask for. Okay. Romans 8, verse 33. Romans 8, verse 33. And now we continue into this third uh, rhetorical question here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies them. In this case, he gives the question, and now he gives a direct answer. So he's not using a question to answer this time. Okay? But he says here, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Okay? Well, there's three possibilities. Okay? God can lay a charge on you. People can. Or the enemy. That's basically it. Okay, and people include you, by the way. Okay, your flesh is your enemy. Don't forget that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have a portion of your old being that's trying to keep you down, keep you dead spiritually. That ain't you anymore. This is how you should think, right? That's what we learn in Romans eight. See that? You need to walk in accordance and following the Spirit of God, which is in your new man. Okay, you got to make that decision day by day. So God, will God lay a charge on you? No. Okay, you're not condemned. Romans 8, verse 1. Okay? If you walk not according to the flesh, but after the Spirit, you're not condemned at all by God. Okay? At no level. Okay? If you're saved, you're not going to hell. That's clear. That condemnation's gone. Your sins are paid for. Your penalty's been paid. But the power of sin in your life doesn't exist either if you're walking in accordance with the Spirit. No condemnation. Okay? What about people? Romans 2. Romans 2, verse 1. Bringing us back here. Look at what we learned before. Romans 2, and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. And guess what? Men will try to condemn you. And they're going to use their conscience to do it. They're going to try to tell you that this whole idea of salvation is ridiculous. What do you mean my works don't matter? Clearly they matter. Okay? Me doing good is what I'm looking at. It's what I'm judging by. That's what I see with my conscience. And they're condemning themselves in the process. Because they ignored in their judgment all the good stuff, all the bad stuff they did. See that? They're hoping to counteract you who brings up, hey, we all do bad stuff. I'm not, I'm not special here. I do bad stuff too. Okay? That's why I needed God's work to save me. Because the only one who didn't do bad stuff was Jesus Christ. That's the whole gospel they're trying to deny. Okay? And they'll condemn you for it. Okay? Christian, if you end up walking in the flesh and somebody who's not saved notices that, they're going to try to bring it up and use it as a, a way to weasel themselves out of the gospel. You're their excuse. Okay? Is that right? No. Okay, but that's the condemnation they're going to try to put on you. It doesn't work, eternally speaking, but it worked enough at least for them. That's why we care about our testimony. We don't want to give them reason to speak evil of the Lord. Okay? We'd rather have good conscience, like Peter says. And we'll get to Peter very soon. Okay, because Paul and Peter agree. And what about the enemy? Well, Romans 12, verse 10 just says he's the accuser of the brethren. He'll always continue to try to do that. Anytime you sin in your mind, the sins I can't see that you do, enemy's up there talking to God. Hey, look what he did. But you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And Jesus is like, look what I did. Okay. That was going to try. Okay. It's not going to hold, though. Okay. Can't lay a charge on God's elect because God justified. God the Father was the one who put that gavel down and declared you righteous. He made a judgment. And there's nobody higher than his Supreme Court. Okay. Talking about the Supreme Court here in America. The Lord's Court's higher. Once he puts the gavel down, that's it. Nobody's going to override him, not even the enemy. And no matter how good his argument looks in the temporal, see? So it is God 
that justify, that should bring up Romans 3, verse 26. Okay? You're justified freely by his grace, which is in Christ Jesus. So he's bringing it all together. Okay? Now, let's, let's take some time here. Because you're God's elect. And automatically, a thought comes to mind for those who know a little bit about Christian doctrine these days. I'm God's elect. I was elect. Okay? Before the foundation of the world, I'm so special. God chose me. Okay? Is that what that means? Okay? Let's do a little study here. Okay? As we talked about Calvinism last week, this is another portion or another set of verses they may use to try to make that argument. Okay? Go to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. In one hand. And then I have Matthew 12 and another. I don't remember why I have Matthew 12. Let's see here and look at it early. Ah, that's it. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. The Bible says. Now, this is only in the King James Bible in English, by the way. If I preach, I bring this up. Especially so you know. All the other Bibles, you can't find this definition for elect. Okay. Which is why they can be used to teach bad doctrine. Okay. What is holy is always unique to what is profane. What is true is always unique to what is an error. It doesn't matter how small the error is. Okay, All it takes is one error to be error. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold mine elect. In whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. Look, singular, pronouns, all these things, right? He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. I only see Gentiles in this room. Okay. He brought judgment to me. What about you? He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall not break, and the smoking flax shall uh, he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. This was written 700 years just about before Jesus Christ popped up. Prophecy. This is what makes the Bible different. This is why we believe the Bible. Okay, I don't waste my time with Islam. It has proven false prophecies in it. Okay. Everybody knows about it. Book of Mormon, it's based on fiction. All that stuff in Utah didn't happen. Okay, for those who know, it's not true with the scripture. It's very different. God proves he's the God of the universe through prophecy. Now, there's two possibilities for this. Okay? It's either the person we hinted about, Jesus Christ, or Israel. Because you read in chapter 43, it's talking about Israel there. Okay? Go to Matthew 12. Let's see what our Savior says. Matthew 12 and verse 15. Start in verse 14 for context. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, that's against Jesus, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, okay, God is against religion. Very important to understand. God is not into religion. He's in a relationship. Okay, he wants connection. 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and, healed, and he healed them all, <clears throat> and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive, nor cry, neither any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, shall he send forth judgment on a victory, and his name, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Let me just read that. Okay. Notice that the Bible tells you that Jesus Christ is that elect. That's what I'm trying to show you. Okay. Reason why you're God's elect. Is because you made a choice to trust in Christ and you got put into Christ. That's what makes you elect. You're not elect before that. Okay? Or sans creation is the fancy word, okay? Because there's really no such thing as before time. That's kind of a contradiction, if you think about it. How can you have before time if there's no time? See? 
But God didn't decide before the foundation of the world who he was going to elect. He elected his son. That's the person he elect. And he came up with a plan and said, whoever trusts in my son, they're going to be the elect. Okay? Yeah. That's why nobody can lay charge against God's elect. Who can lay charge against Jesus? The devil tried. He failed. Who's stronger than him? I ain't no other creature. See? And when God justifies you, he puts you into Christ. Okay. Now, now that we understand that reality, we all say glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay. If nobody can lay charge against me anymore, I must have eternal security. I must have eternal assurance. I can't lose my salvation because nobody can take it away. Nobody can come to God and prove to God that I'm a sinner again. What that mean? Sin. But what we need to recognize in our lives before we come to find Jesus Christ, okay, and after, is the reality that charges of sin, that idea of that weight's going to come. Okay. But it's 2 Corinthians 7. I don't think I have it up there. 2 Corinthians 7. So forgive me for that. Second Corinthians seven and verse ten, very famous verse. Okay. Here Paul says, For godly sorrow, okay, that's sorrow in accordance with the truth of God, with recognition of the reality that God's word is right about you. That's conviction. Conviction does what? Worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Okay. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. So when you are without hope and without God, and you recognize that, and you repented toward God and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you got saved, and that isn't going to be repented of. God's not going to change his mind about it. Likewise, Christian, as you continue to grow in grace and knowledge, you're going to see more things about your life that God's going to want to prune and make you grow closer, be more conforming image of his son. And when you get to the point where you truly repent with godly sorrow, he'll deliver you from it, and you won't go back. That's how you deal with besetting sins. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, okay? Your old man's going to want to keep some hold on you, okay? Some things God will deliver you from in an instant. God did that with me with alcohol, okay, and smoking, okay? Instantly. So I asked him. I was sick of it, okay? Other besetting sins are a battle, okay? I'll ask him, I'll be delivered for months, get tempted, do it one time again, oh, I got to get back on my knees. The fight happens again. Maybe for a few months I'm gone. Other people might be a day, okay? I didn't get to a few months instantly, by the way. It took time. Um, but that means, uh, yeah, I'm repenting, but I haven't gotten to the point where it's pure godly sorrow, like complete. And I know it. Okay, I know that when I when I ask God to deliver me from, from drinking and stuff, I, I really was done. Okay? And if that happens, it'll be the type of salvation that I'll never repent of again. Okay? Now, I'll say all this because the reality is you're kind of laying a charge against yourself when you're doing that. And God is working with you to help you in this process to become more holy, but it's not going to take away your justification. That's why I'm bringing it up. Okay? Yes, you're going to sin, Christian, after you're saved, but you're going to sin less because you're saved. Okay? It won't be sinless, but you'll sin less. Okay? Now, if you don't see that, were you justified? Okay. Or as your people, we wonder, were you really saved in the first place? Is what you usually hear people say. Okay. That's what they mean. Okay. Because your walk doesn't match what you claim to have possessed in your heart at this point. You made a profession of faith. And you don't seem to care about the guy you profess. That's kind of weird. Okay. Imagine professing marriage to your wife. Okay. Think about my wife in my case. And the next day, I don't see her. I don't want to talk to her. I avoid her all the time. Would you think I was serious? Okay. Would you think I'm just an idiot? Okay. Probably the latter. Now take that up a notch with God. This is why we say this to people. Are you saved? Do you know what you what you apparently did? Do you understand? Okay. Makes you wonder. Now you only need his faith as much as a mustard seed for it to happen. Okay. But hey, that that's trust, man. Okay? A lot of people can't do that with God. 
they fight God and not do that. It's kind of weird. Okay. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 34. Yeah, I would be an idiot to not do it my way. Say that. Romans 8, verse 34. Love that lady. Romans 8, verse 34. Okay. Fourth question. Who is he that condemneth? Well, that's rhetorical. There's nobody. Okay. Now, I read some verses here. Just so you, you know. Um. Actually, we'll look at those. We got some. Let's go to John five. We'll look at those. So I'm not sure who has seen those before. John five verse twenty two. Let's say you're witnessing to somebody. And they'll try to tell you only God can judge me. Well, here you go. Romans or John five. Excuse me. John 5, verse 22, let's deal with that. Who is he that condemneth? And you'd be like, yeah, you're right. Only God can judge you. You're right. Who's, who's that? Who's going to be there to judge you? Who's God? God is God. Uh, John 5, verse 22. Jesus says, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto his Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Famous verse, John 5, verse 24. Look at that verse. He starts off with he that heareth my word. So you know what you just did here, Christian? You said, look, Jesus is God. And I'm giving you God's word so you won't be condemned because if you don't receive it, you will be. That's his judgment. See how you did that? So you took their response and used it against them for God's glory. Just by reading what Jesus said and noting, look, he tells you to listen to his words. That's what I'm giving you is the word of God. I'm giving you the gospel here. It's God's word. And if you believe on that, you'll have everlasting life and you won't see any condemnation because you're right. God will condemn you. But surprise, surprise, when you get there, you're going to see that the person sitting on the great white throne there isn't some random, ambiguous person. No, it's a man with nail scar prints in his hands and in his feet and in his side looking right dead at you in your eyes. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Let's go there. Now, every religion talks about God judging them. And they keep it general for a reason because they don't want to admit that truth right there. Who is he that condemneth? Oh, Jesus. Ultimately, he doesn't want to condemn you. If you're justified, you won't be condemned by him. So then nobody can get you either. Nobody else can. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, this is Jesus talking, okay? <laughs> He's telling you, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, okay? And people are going to get there at the great right there and say, you're my God, you're, Lord, you're the Lord. Okay? He's like, huh? Okay. 21. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, what's his will? That you get saved? That all should come to repentance? That they repent toward God the Father and place their faith in Jesus? That's, that's his will. God's will for every person when they're, when they're actually conceived and born into this earth is that they obey the new commandment, which is to believe on his Son. Part one. Part two, oh, you did that? Now you got to walk with him, love him the way he loved you. See that? We're in part two. Praise God. All this stuff is just explaining part two. That's all sanctification is. You want to keep it simple, sweetheart. Yeah. 22. Many will say to me in that day, the great white throne, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And you know what? Many people who claim to be Christians talk about the Lord Jesus. Yeah. All the time. They didn't do the will of the Father which is in heaven. And in thy name have cast out devils. And you know what? The devil is so smart. He'll make sure that their exorcisms work. Or at least appear to work. Devil ain't no dummy. If you believe in experiences and miracles, he'll make sure you get a few. Miracles don't produce faith, by the way. Only the word does. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's where God's will is written down for you. 
and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. The power for me, ye that work iniquity. And that's what's going to happen. God's judgment is going to be pretty simple. I don't even know who you are. Go away. Okay? You didn't want my presence your entire life. Now you can leave mine. Because okay? he'll show you how many times he tried to, to talk to you. Okay? He'll make that clear. As you continue to argue how much you, you know, live for him in all this. Trying to butter yourself up in front of God. Okay? I get it. I did it in front of my parents. It didn't work. Okay? They reminded me of the bad stuff I did. Okay? How about our Heavenly Father? Okay? God, God ain't no dummy. Okay? He's God. And so we see, yeah, at God of it, He ultimately is the one that will condemn people. Truly. Okay? But the idea is that you can avoid that judgment. And that's why, Romans 8, verse 34... He cuts his little question quick, and he gives you a very important statement here, responding to it. Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. He's telling you he's doing it. Yeah. I didn't just make it up here. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I'm trying to tell you, look, then you're good to go, aren't you? If you happen to know the person in the judgment seat, you know the judge, you're probably going to have a good end, aren't you? Yeah. Probably going to work out. What do we see in this present evil world? People who got in with the judges and they avoid all kinds of judgment they should be receiving. Yeah. If you know God, you avoid a judgment that you should receive, but it will be legal. Okay? Because he already paid the penalty for you. That's the difference. These judges can't pay any penalties for you. They're committing sin. And they do that. So it's the Christ of the scriptures, okay? Not the Christ of some religion that claims Christianity. The Christ of JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, isn't even God. He's not. They'll call him the Lord, but he's not God, okay? For them, so you're aware. The Christ of Islam is a prophet, peace be upon him. That's all they're going to give him, okay? They lift up Muhammad more than Christ, even though even in the Quran, Jesus never sinned. And Muhammad did. I guess you didn't know that. He's called the word of Allah. You see how, see how the Lord's trying to help these people? If they just read the Quran and really were believing certain things, they'd wake up. But no, they believe their religion. They believe the precepts taken out of there by some old guy. Okay, and walk with those. And kind of ignore the rest of the Quran. It doesn't sound right to them. It doesn't match that. Sound familiar? I did that for 24 years. What about Christ in, in uh, Hinduism and the rest? He's just another God over there, part of the pantheon. Just throw him in there. Okay? Add him to the list and our teraphim. Just put him right there. Don't tell me he's greater than Brahma, though. Even though Brahma doesn't even have a personality, he's, he's, he's apersonal. I don't know how that works. They talk about him like he's a person all the time. Okay. See? Buddha, oh, he was enlightened. He's just a man, though. The Christ of the scriptures. Because there is only one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. That's it? He's the only one? Will you come to him? If you do, nobody's going to condemn you. Because the one on the one on the judgment seat there is the one that condemns. Because he's God. So you're good to go. We're showing you how serious the security of salvation really is. Okay? This is at every level, man. So I don't... I'm baffled by Christians who claim they can lose their salvation. Are they not reading this chapter? They don't believe what's being said here. Okay? Honestly. And all of them don't understand justification. That's where you show them that. They don't get that at all. And that's why you say, you, it's probably because you're not justified. Okay? You're trusting in yourself somewhere. You didn't really give it all to God. Romans 8, verse 35. And right here we have the final question, which looks like two questions, but when you look at the scriptures there, English is really interesting. 
okay, to where you can put a question mark in the middle of a, of a sentence and it's fine. Okay, you do that today in college, you'll probably mark it wrong. Okay, but that's how English actually works. Okay. So if you call it six questions, that's fine, but I don't like the number six for those who know. Okay, you probably know why I don't like the number six. Five is the number of grace, so I'll go with that. But Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? <coughs> now, if you were to read that second question there without the first, it, would, it wouldn't even be a complete sentence for those who know grammar. Let's just show you how that works. But this is all rhetorical again. Okay, who can separate you? I mean, you know the one who gave you the love. You're in him. You see? Okay. What's this tribulation look like? I think I wrote the wrong verse there. Go to Mark 4. Mark 4. I put Matthew there. Showed you how awake I am on night shift. Mark 4 and verse 17. This is talking about those people who... It's like the parable of the sower here. And in Mark 4, verse 17, talking about that they have no root in themselves and so endure before a time. So they got some of the word in Anon. They were happy about it with gladness. But they don't have any root. They didn't get the root of the stem of Jesse. Okay? That's Jesus. They didn't get him. And so afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended and they leave. Showing that they weren't really saved. But if you can deal with that because you live in accordance with the word, then you can deal with tribulation. And we read Romans 5 verse 3 told you that tribulation worketh patience and patient experience and experience hope and hope maketh not a shame for the Holy Ghost is shut abroad in your hearts. Yeah. Tribulation is part of the Christian growth. So it shouldn't be, and it's the first thing on the list. So why would that be the first thing that caused you to walk off? Makes you wonder. Okay, are you saying? Because you, it's, like, it's like you're trying to say something can separate you from God's love. You couldn't even deal with that. Okay. Oh, somebody made fun of me because I read the Bible too. When you were lost, you dealt with people who said worse things to you. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, I've been called tons of names when I didn't know God. I didn't let that stuff faze me, man. And yet, when I, when I tried to quote scripture to him, I remember when I was a baby, stuff that still bothered me, man. I, I couldn't understand it. Tiny things. Oh, you're one of those Jesus fanatics. Like, why did that bother me? Okay, I've been called worse. This goes to show how spiritual spiritual battle is serious, man. Okay. But God will get you through it, is what I'm saying. <clears throat> and there's a purpose to the tribulation. Like I said, it works that patience, experience, and brings that hope to you. What about the stress? 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10. Paul says, Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And as you grow in your Christian faith and you deal with the stresses and tribulations, you'll recognize that, yeah, your weakness in that time can be bolstered by the grace of God to let you get through and have the victory. He can make sure that you're not stuck in depression over these things. These distresses won't hold you. Okay. Persecution. Why? Because all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You should want to live godly, though. Romans 8 told you why. Okay. Don't you want to get... Be a joint heir with Christ. The sufferings of this present time don't compare to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Right? Yeah. And then you have there famine. Famine. And we won't go there, but Philippians 4 tells you about physical famine. Okay, There were times where Paul was starving. He was hungry. But he said he could do all things through Christ which strengtheneth him. That verse is talking about that. Okay? It's not the strength to make sure that you're the head CEO of a company, because 
Most Christians who are doing that aren't really witnessing. They're too busy trying to run their company. Okay? That, that requires 24-7 work for you to know. It's very difficult to live for God. That might happen. Okay? Maybe it really is in God's will and your guidance, but it's very rare. But the actual famine that's happening right now in 2022 is in Amos 8, verse 11, which tells you that there's not a famine of food or water or anything like that. There's a famine of the Word of God. Because most Christians don't know or have the Word today. Yeah. If you have the Word, you're already doing really well. Okay? You, you're going to have a better chance to walk with God. Or nakedness. Okay? And that can refer to as small as not having enough, enough clothing, like missing a, a scarf so you're cold. Or it can go as far as not having clothing at all. And those are the verses there. We're not going to read them. Okay? It can be both. Okay. But if you happen to have that situation, God's going to help you get through it. So claim this verse when you're in a moment where you're, you're cold and you feel like you don't have enough warmth. Or peril, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. And 2 Corinthians is the epistle for ministry. So that's why many Christians don't like what this epistle says, is it basically says the ministry is, is, is rough. Okay, the real ministry. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. In journeyings often, Paul says, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of by mine own countrymen. Okay, I should be dealing with Hispanics. Okay, it'd be rough for me. In perils by the heathen. So everybody else in Noblesville. In perils in the city. Okay. When in Indianapolis, okay, somebody threw a full beer can at me, hit my leg. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. It's like he covered every single possible problem that could exist. Yeah, you read that and apply it to yourself. None of that will separate you from love of God. None of it. Yeah. Or in sword, which is you physically dying for your faith, which happens today, just not in America. But it's coming. Okay, people they're already arresting people just because they're anti-abortion. For those who don't know. Okay. They arrested a pastor for that recently. FBI came in. No real charges or nothing. They won't actually show the charges. They refuse to give them to the courts when they get subpoenaed. Don't go any further. Getting there, but you, you go to the Middle East, they're dying. You go to North Korea, people are dying for their faith. Today. But that won't separate you from the love of God. Okay. And even if you're not walking in accordance with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Christian, you won't lose your salvation either. It will affect your walk, though. But it won't separate you from the love of Christ. That's how serious his salvation is. Okay. And so can any of these things separate you from the love of God? No, nope, of course not. That was the point of that rhetorical question. Romans 8, verse 36. Romans 8, verse 36. So we're seeing the security of our salvation. And Paul could have just said this once, but he keeps repeating it and repeating it because he's hoping somebody going to get it. I figure if he said it five different ways, you might get it. And people still don't get it. That's not interesting. Romans 8, verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And notice, this is all fulfillment of prophecy. That's what that's telling you. Okay. The crucified life is what our heavenly vocation is. That's what our goal is. And it will involve dealing with these things, understanding that it will never separate you from the love of Christ. That's why early Christians, they suffered in a lot of ways. And you will too if you decide to live for God. But it's okay. It's all going to work out for good, remember? Okay. That suffering is temporal. Focus on God in the moment so you don't get caught up in it and lose sight of Him. And that will help you get through and we saw how when we discussed this chapter. Okay. We won't read this for the sake of time, but 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25, tell you that Jesus Christ is your example. Okay. And how he had no guile. And he didn't revel. And he didn't speak back to people when they reviled him. And he committed all those things they did to the one who had judgment for him. He gave it to God the Father to allow him to deal with it. That's called meekness. And he's your current shepherd and bishop of your soul. So trust Jesus. Romans 8 verse 37. 
Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now Paul's telling you, look, it's even, we, we didn't just barely make it. We didn't scarcely get saved through it. You're more than a conqueror through all these things. And so now he's taking this and using it to exhort you to live for God. Do you recognize that? You're beyond winning here. Okay? Why? Because, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the labor that we do in the Lord is not in vain. Right, preacher? That's his favorite verse, by the way. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. None of it's in vain. It'll always have fruit. Okay? And then Peter says it his way in 1 Peter 4. I'll let you read that on your own, verses 12 through 16. He tells you you need to be happy if you're suffering for Christ because of the glory that's being occurred for that. If you suffer as a Christian, happy are you? Okay. And then we'll end with the last two very famous verses. These are the ones that most people quote to say that they have eternal security. And so Paul ends his argument saying, For I am persuaded... You know who persuaded him? God himself. He learned this from the Lord for three years. Okay. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, so there's the enemy, okay. nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, that's right now, nor things to come in the future, only things that can hurt you, right? Nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus our Lord. Remember that verse. Those two verses. Stick them in your heart. Okay? That'll help you. Okay? Neither death nor life. What you do in your life will not separate you from the Lord God, Christian. If you choose to commit suicide and go through it, you're still going to heaven. Now, you're going to have a lot to answer about. You can't have to explain that to God. Good luck. Okay? But you're going to go to heaven. That's the doctrinal reality. Because it's not based on you. It's based on Christ and God's justification of you for trusting him from your heart. Okay. For those who don't know, suicide, according to the Bible, is a supernatural thing. It's not natural to go against your own flesh. So if you do that, you're being affected by principalities and powers. Okay. And the reason why you're thinking about that, to be honest with you, is because you lack faith. That's what drives people to do that. They don't trust God. They don't believe what God's promises. And so they think that, yeah, I need to end it now. If they believe the Bible, they recognize they're going somewhere worse if they do that. Okay? <laughs> Wouldn't even think about doing that. They try to get that thing settled and trust in trusting God. And let Him deliver them from their feelings. Okay? What if you walk away from the faith? Okay? Well, life. If you're really saved and you do that, you're not going to lose your salvation. Okay. Angels, principalities, powers. There's the devil and his angels. They can't stop it. Okay. Nor height, nor depth. That refers to the entirety of anything in the universe. Okay. Ephesians 3, verse 18. I'll show you that. Okay. Nor any other creature. So you can't stop this. The devil can't. Anybody else in the world. The Pope can't. If he declares you as cathedra, okay, you're still going to heaven. All right. Muhammad declared us all damned. We're still going to heaven. Okay. If you didn't know... Apparently, Christians exist to receive the sins of the Muslims and it's put on us, according to the Quran. Okay? What he said doesn't matter. Okay? That's a curse cause us. It shall not stand, the Bible says. Okay? This is why I'm bringing this up, just so you can see how far this goes. Okay? None of those things will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So you should rest in that. That's the message of Romans 8. It's so important. Okay? John 3 is great if you want to show somebody why they need to be born again. John 8 is important to show people that Jesus Christ is not religious. He wants you to have a relationship with him. Okay? Because he deals directly with religious leaders, right? But Romans 8 shows you why you should live for God. Okay? So I'll beseech you just like Paul and say, try to get Romans 8 here. It'll help you grow. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for showing us the security of our salvation, and we thank you for this reality, that you made this decision, Lord, and we decided to trust you and your word about that. And for that reason, you've justified us, Lord, and made sure that we can't lose our salvation. 
So help us, Lord, to recognize that and then apply that to our Christian walk so that we can walk not according to the flesh, but after the spirit of the living.